What's going on guys, I'm back. It is like 6,000 degrees in Utah right now. Uh, seriously, no joke, I got in the car today. It was 111 degrees outside. So um, I'm in the garage, I don't have AC in there. So stay with me, um, I might get off topic a little bit. Hopefully I don't pass out from heat stroke. Uh, just wanted to give you guys a quick update of where we're at with the 97 Cobra. Um, I'm actually standing kind of away because I've got a little uh, fun thing to show you, the wheels that I picked out for it, which you'll see later in the video. Um, but before that, I wanted to go through a couple things. So I'm actually a little bit behind in the editing. Um, I've gotten so far where I try to take the car through emissions uh, this weekend, but unfortunately I did not pass. We'll go through that in a second. Um, but I'm gonna show you, I actually put together a, a little chart here that I made to try and cover all the different items that I plan to do to the car in the short term. Now this isn't a fully encompassing list. There may be more projects that pop up, um, but these are the basic things that are gonna need to happen in order to get the car one, uh, we need to get it through inspection. We need to get it tagged because it's not tagged right now. So when I go out and test drive it, you know, it's not good. So I got to do that. Two is basic maintenance. There are some maintenance items that I have going on with the car that I noticed um, both when I bought it and after I bought it that I need to address. That's number two. And finally, the fun stuff, what I'm going to do to get it on the track. Those things will most likely be later um, just because I need to focus on the first two items first, but they're coming. Don't worry. Okay, so in this video today, um, a few of the things that we're gonna talk about, number one, are the over axle pipes. So when I bought the car, it didn't have any exhaust after um, the mid pipe, basically. And again, that's probably something that you may not fail emissions for, but if you're trying to take it through like I was, and you really wanna try and make this car look and seem stock and not draw any red flags, because it has been modified, um, it's just something I think you want to address, plus the drone issue. So um, we're going to show you what I did to address that, to add the rest of the exhaust system, as well as some of the potential issues that I ran into. Uh, in addition to that, I'm going to show you the new wheels and tires I got. The previous owner had Toyo drag radials on the back and some Federal uh, tires on the front mix matched. So we're going to get rid of those. I'm going to show you the wheels and tires that I went with and why. Um, Let's see, what else are we gonna go through today? A few of the other things we're gonna talk about are uh, the cooling system. So when I bought the car and I noticed this on the test drive, it was actually running kind of hot. So we're gonna talk about what I did to go and address that. And it's actually pretty cool because this is one of the things where I thought it was gonna be a huge issue, uh, but I was able to troubleshoot it and figure it out. So the exhaust, I'm sorry, the coolant system, see that's me being real hot right now. The coolant system is figured out. This thing is running nice and cool, so that's great. Um, and then the last thing that I had to do, this there was no way I was gonna pass emissions with this, was get the nitro system off the car. So I got the nitro system pretty much 99% removed, and I'll show you that. I learned some cool things along the way um, about how you would set up a nitro system on this car, um, and I'm gonna have that for sale, so hopefully I can recoup uh, some money. Right, let's so dive into the content uh, of this video, and also don't forget to follow me on social media on Instagram, truck and roll 989 um, I will post pictures and updates before the videos come out, so if you wanna check it out, um, Check that out on Instagram. All right, let's get started. Uh, the previous owner had installed some really wide meats on it. He's got uh, drag radials in the back. Uh, those are 315s. They are super wide. Um, so wide, in fact, that they didn't clear the exhaust and they were rubbing on some things. So he had to remove uh, the sway bar, which I'll have to reinstall. So in addition to the sway bar, uh, rubbing he the over axle pipes that come up over the axles and then on these models kind of run up under uh, the rear bumper cover uh, he had to remove those so now it's just dumping right after the mufflers luckily you can buy over, over axle pipes they'll come out the back look a lot better okay so I got these over axle pipes from American Muscle they're made by SR Performance they're stainless steel um, look pretty good but supposedly they fit everything from fox bodies through sn95s i think up to like 99 maybe or up to 98. It just looks too good to be like true really lucky these should just drop right in but they probably won't okay so i kind of had to stop filming yesterday because a i was blocking the camera and b i was getting frustrated and but anyways i got the over axle pipes installed um, from sr performance i think they look okay um tad bit small but stockish looking which is good because i want to get this thing inspected and uh, i really don't need any additional reasons for them not to pass me so um i'll leave those on there for now 
So it was actually really good that I took some time and went and test drove it with the new over axle pipes uh, before installing the new wheels and tires, which I'll show you in a second because I found out the exact reason why the guy had removed uh, the old over axle pipes. And that's because even though I was able to get clearance on them uh, in the garage, when I went out and got them on the street, things settled a little bit and uh, they started rubbing the tires again. It wasn't bad on the driver's side. It actually never touched on the driver's side, but on the passenger side, it rubbed really bad. Um, and you're driving and it's not like you start to smell something. So let me show you what happened to the tire real quick and then kind of how I finessed it and got it to work. So if you have a 96 to 98 Cobra and you have this problem, you, you can make it work, um, but there are some things that will help you or hurt you. And let, I'll show you those in a second. So here are the old wheels uh, and tires that were removed. And uh, this was on the passenger side. If you look here, you can see all burnt rubber um, where it was actually rubbing. And let me show you exactly where. Now I went and vacuumed and, and got it. So uh, it's, it's not touching anymore, but at the time it was real bad. It coated the whole underside of the car. It was caked all over the exhaust. There's actually, um, it's hard to see, but there's a burn mark right there where it kind of left a big chunk um, in there. So what you're gonna wanna do if you, if you have um, these over axle pipes is you don't just want to install the over axle pipe and stop. So what I mean by that, and this applies to most exhaust systems, um, if you're having trouble fitting, let's say the over axle pipes, but you've got exhaust manifolds, mid pipe, um, the section that comes after mid pipe, all that stuff installed, and you're just trying to do the over axle pipes and you're fighting things, it's usually best to start loosening things up, working your way back. So I, I actually loosened everything all the way back to uh, the mid pipe and then started fitting them from there. And I took a block of wood and I put that in between the tire to kind of keep it roughly where I wanted it. Um, I had my wife come out and she tugged on the exhaust a little bit. And then I started to tighten down the clamps and, and try to understand where, um, where things were binding, where I could get more movement. And I was able to get roughly, I want to say probably an inch or so on the passenger side, about an inch and a half clearance on the driver's side when I was done. So that was, that was really cool. So this will work um, and they're no longer going to rub. One more thing, and I know I'm not supposed to be showing these wheels yet. That's for later in the video. Um, one more thing to talk about, let's walk back over here, is your offset. So your offset's really important. Um, these were American muscle wheels that the previous owner had. They were 17 by 10 and a half. And I think the offset was not helping me in terms of clearance there. So um, they were non-deep dish wheels, but they were also sitting in further. The new ones that I got from late model restoration, these SVE wheels um, have a better offset and you actually gain on both sides probably like a quarter of an inch or so just by installing those. So that's another thing to consider. You can run 315s in the back of a 96 to 98 Cobra and it looks like you could even run a Mustang GT exhaust, but you gotta make sure that you take your time fitting it um, and also make sure you get the right wheels. If you have the wrong offset, you are really gonna fight this and you will bugger up your brand new tire. So just keep that in mind, um, but this part is crossed off the list. So that's one last thing to worry. Okay, without further ado, here are the wheels that I chose for my 97 Cobra. So what you're looking at is a set of SVE wheels from Late Model Restoration. They're 17 by nine in the front and 17 by 10 in the back. They are what's called their SVE anniversary wheels. I believe they're reminiscent of like a 2003 Cobra wheel, except they've got that cool deep dish look in the back that you wouldn't have got in 2003. These come wrapped in Nitto NT555 generation two tires. They are a pretty solid summer only tire. Um, you could go to an NT05, which is an even more aggressive tire, but I think these will be a good combination for uh, both the street and also the track. It got way too hot outside. I needed to come inside to try and complete the rest of this video. So um, basically we got the exhaust figured out. We got the wheels and tires figured out. I know it sits too high. I'll, I'll get to the springs and shocks later. Um, the big thing, the really, really big thing that I needed to address was the overheating issue. So I'm gonna show you how I troubleshot that, starting with what I was seeing at the gauge. So if you have a 96 to 98 Cobra or maybe a 94 to 98, somewhere in there Mustang, and you're seeing your gauge is high, but especially the dual overhead cam four valve Cobras. If you're seeing the gauges reading high and maybe a shop has replaced the thermostat or done something to your cooling system, you're definitely gonna wanna check this out um, because 
there are issues that pop up with these and they're not easy to burp, uh, meaning getting all the air out of it. So take a look at what I was seeing and also what I did to, to troubleshoot it and fix it. You go inside the car and you look at the gauge, it's kind of above where I would like to see it, right? You know, it's not in the middle, it's kind of towards the higher end. I don't know, I don't, I don't love that. Um, here's what's weird, right? So the upper radiator hose, as far as I can tell, fan came on, but you know, it's stagnant, right? You're not getting 187, it's not the same. You're not getting flow this way, okay? You're getting flow that way. Okay, you come down underneath the car and look. It's gonna be loud, I apologize. Basically, what this looks like to me is this is your thermostat housing. And I believe when the thermostat doesn't open, it just comes down this line and through here and back up. Because when I shoot the temps, you know, the housing, 204, 197, okay, hot. overview of what I plan to do here. Um, I noticed using my little handy dandy IR gun that when I would shoot the temperatures on the upper radiator hose and then the hose that uh, the thermostat is hooked to, even when I was seeing temperatures at the crossover tube in excess of you know 205 to 210 degrees, the thermostat wasn't opening. And I'm again, I'm just learning about these four valves, but to me, if you've got 205 degrees up top, the thermostat is supposed to open at, you know, I think 192 to 198, somewhere in there, 195 for um, the stock thermostat. It just doesn't seem like it's opening. And I think that might be why it's running hot. So I think what I'm gonna do is um, drain the coolant, remove the thermostat, and then I'm gonna do a little test in some boiling water and see if I can't get it to open using my temp gun and see if it is actually opening. If it is opening, um, then I may have just made a headache for myself because burping the air out of these is the problem, but it could be that my issue is I've got air trapped in the system. So there's actually a really good video on YouTube and I'll post a link to it um, if you have a four valve and you're trying to get the air out. But let me show you something real quick here. Let me walk over. I'm, let me show you the coolant crossover tube and what I'm talking about. Okay, so you might be tempted just to go and fill your system from here. Actually, that's incorrect. On these four valve cars, you've got this coolant crossover tube. It's a metallic tube. This takes a quarter inch drive extension. You wanna put it in there and loosen this up. And this is actually where you fill from. Um, and otherwise you get air pockets. Now, if you've never touched that before, it's gonna be in there super tight. And from reading or watching the other videos, I found that you wanna just use a good solid ratchet extension. Um, I actually put some heat to it with some map gas, just real careful to break it loose. And um, it, those things, I could, I could just picture breaking off ratchets and sockets in there trying to get it loose. Again, it's not an Allen, it's just a square quarter inch drive. I don't know why Ford didn't you know, use a 3 8 drive or something larger so you wouldn't break tools, but they didn't. Um, so once you do get that apart, like I said, use heat, take your time, um, but put anti-seize on it when you put it back together. So I've already done that. That's already been broken loose, um, but we're just going to go ahead and uh, try and drain the coolant right now. Okay, so we got that draining in the background. Um, a little odd. I kind of assumed when I undid the, you know, when I undid the drain and hooked the hose up to it and then also took the radiator cap off, it would just start flowing because there's no vacuum not the case which was kind of weird and then I um, I undid the coolant crossover plug same thing so I had to open it more and eventually came out um, I don't know maybe it's nothing just seemed a little odd but uh, gotta let that drain for a while I was gonna do more of a time-lapse but um, my battery's running low so we'll just let that drain um, I did notice another spot that looks like it might be leaking I might have to replace the o-rings on the oil cooler um, so I might just go ahead and order that and uh, plan on doing that when I change the oil. Okay, here is the uh, thermostat I picked up. This is a 180 uh, from Stant. 
There's the part number, 14138. Your other options are a 170 or a stock. I felt 170 might be a little cool, um, and I don't have access to get the computer retuned to reset the um, fan turn on and off temp. So 180, I think, is a good in the middle. Uh, you do have to buy an O-ring. That's a separate part. I got mine from Felpro. You can get it from Ford. Uh, looks like that, but it does not come with the thermostat, so just make sure you plan on picking that and the O-ring up if you're going to do this. Okay. Okay, so the first question, is that the way the thermostat's supposed to be facing? I don't, I don't know. Time for the fun part. Let me shut the back up here. Notice the noise. I pop the thermostat out, totally miss the entire drain pan, and then slide it back underneath where it needs to go. Please tell me you guys do this kind of stupid stuff too. What's that? Oh, we caught it. There's your coolant everywhere. There is some crud on it. I mean, that looks like a brand new thermostat, which is weird, you know? But, motor, Motorad, patented, so you know it's good. Let's see if we can find some markings on this maybe to determine what, what size it was, I don't know. All right, I gotta clean up this mess. Today on the cooking channel, just kidding, we're gonna try a little test here. I've got the old thermostat sitting in some water, I'm heating it up. Um, I'm gonna take an IR gun and I'm gonna see when that thermostat opens. It says it's a 195, but it wasn't opening. So we're gonna test and see when it actually opens, begins to open. Um, and then we're gonna test it with a new thermostat, which is a 180 and it should open sooner. So what we're looking for here is late opening or no opening at all. Check it out. I had planned to be really slick here and I was gonna take video of the old thermostat versus the new thermostat, hopefully showing that the old thermostat wouldn't open or it opened erratically or at some super high temperature. What wound up happening was it was very difficult to use an IR gun and also film by myself and get accurate temperature readings. All you need to know from here is that both thermostats did in fact open. Um, the one that was listed for 180 seemed to open around 180 and the old one opened somewhere between 195 to 200 degrees. Maybe a little bit higher than what you want, but it still was working, so it was not a broken thermostat. Okay, I'm gonna save you guys a lot of videos. So here's what I learned. Um, the old thermostat wasn't stuck. Here's the old one. It did open. You could argue that it opened less but it's hard to tell. From the best that I could tell, this thing opens up around 195 to 200. So it's listed as a 195. It, it may open just a little bit later, but it's not like 100% faulty, okay? So that's one thing we know. Um, this one obviously opens up sooner. It appears to open up more. It's a little bit different design when you look at the top. This is kind of shrouded, that kind of isn't. Um, both of them, this piece that looks kind of like a bullet, slides down. Uh, the other thing I noticed is they're not the same height. Not sure if that's a huge issue, but you know, that this slides down like that, so it can be. Um, this has got some holes in the bottom of it. This one doesn't. This one also has these little things on the side. The stant one doesn't. So, I don't know. Um, this one looks like it's by a company called Moto Red, which it's not Motorcraft, so we know this is aftermarket. So I'm wondering if this is even the right style of thermostat. Um, but it's not a faulty thermostat, but it may not be the right one. So we're gonna we're gonna put this one in, and we're gonna see if this fixes the problem at all. So I don't I don't really know, but. Um, we'll give it, give it a shot. These things just work differently. When you press on this one, that part stays there, but this part moves versus this one, the whole piece moves. And then, so yeah, um, let's try it out and see.
So I went ahead and I put the new thermostat in knowing that it was the correct one for my car. At the same time, I went back and researched the old thermostat and was able to determine that it was actually for a 97 GT and not a Cobra. And all I can think of at this point was that it was for the wrong motor and therefore did not work in my application. Hey, if you guys are with me to this point, I really appreciate it. I know this video is starting to get long, so I'm gonna try and speed some things up here. I did have more stuff filmed, but we're gonna skip through that. Um, basically, when I installed a new thermostat, it worked perfectly. The only thing I will say, and you should go and review this online, Reich Performance, I think it's R-E-I-S-C-H-E, um, they make thermostats for this car, but more importantly, they also have a really good how-to on how to burp the coolant system with this. Um, basically, what you need to know is that you don't want to have the overflow expansion tank and the coolant crossover tube open at the same time. You basically want to fill this first, shut this, meaning shut the cap and leave it, and then do all your filling from here. It's not something that's going to get done in 10, 20 minutes. You basically have to go through a couple heat cycles, let the car warm up, let it cool down, let the thermostat open, burp it, this, that, and the other. It's, you're gonna take it a whole day, basically, to get this thing correct. And it's not that you're taking a whole day of trial and error, but you basically just wanna give the coolant time to fully heat up when the thermostat opens and also fully cool down. And when you follow their instructions to a T, it will work perfectly, trust me. It worked on this one, and now this thing is good. So, so far in this video, we've knocked out, let's see, exhaust, we've knocked out uh, tires, we've knocked out coolant. Last thing, real quick, we are gonna run through the uh, nitrous system and what I had to do to get that removed, and then I'll go over a couple more things, wrap it up for this time. You saw how the car looked before with nitrous. Now all you do is just snap your fingers, it's all gone. The nitrous system is fully pulled off. Um, if you have a nitrous system on a car that you are trying to remove, just a couple things to note, if it's a wet system and it's injecting on the intake, you will need to plug the hole on the underside of the intake. Um, this is aluminum, so unfortunately you can't just weld it back up, but if we zoom in here, um, there's a little plug that I installed. So that is good. Um, these cars need a tack adapter to basically give a RPM signal to the nitrous controller. Um, and then that also talks to a wide open throttle switch. So that switch is now removed, that's gone. Um, and then the wiring here, they had to cut into this wire loom to get a signal from, I believe it's pin 34 in here. So um, I didn't have a whole lot of wire to play with. Ideally it would've been nice to like fully home run that wire back. But uh, what I did was just undo this, solder in a new section. So I only have two joints. I got rid of all the butt connections and uh, taped it all back up, and that's good. Um, I've got all the old stuff on the table over here. You know, if you're doing this on a car you're, of this year, you're gonna need a tack adapter uh, for nitrous. You've got your window switch, your ability to tune your nitrous system, um, all your solenoids and all that stuff. It's all gone. I took the bottle out. Um, basically, this car looks, you know, completely stock under the hood, minus the cold air intake, which is super nice. Okay, so that about wraps it up uh, for this video. Um, hopefully you guys learned a couple things like I did along the way. Unfortunately, in the whole process of doing this, you uncover more issues. One of my main issues that I have right now um, is, well, there's kind of two, maybe three. There is a leak underneath, which hopefully is oil, but it may be power steering. I'm not really sure. I'm gonna have to address that. Also, um, when I checked with the voltmeter, I was able to determine that if you start the car, it appears that the alternator is charging the battery um, when you first start it up. However, it's nighttime if you've got headlights on, if you've got a fan on or both fan or the high speed fan on, it's just not enough to charge. Um, and what I think that is, I don't think it's a faulty alternator. I think it's these stupid underdrive pulleys that people install on cars. I'm sorry, it just makes me mad. So um, it's actually really difficult to get the correct size alternator pulley for these cars, they are not the same size as the GT. You need a 59 millimeter. Um, I found it from a company in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, the Ford part number you are looking for is GP713. I'm telling you that, but good luck finding it because you can't find it on eBay, you can't find it on AutoZone, you can't find it anywhere. So um, if you have one, hold on to it. If you put underdrive pulleys in your car, save the old pulley because if you ever want to go back, they are hard to find. 
Um, the last issue that I have is I've been hearing a ticking noise and I know what you guys are thinking. If you know Cobras, that's not good. Um, but what I think it actually is, I don't think it's a valve train tick. I think it's um, the previous owner had installed shorty headers and I don't think they came back and tightened all the bolts after they installed it. I found one, or actually I found two that were backed about a half inch out and I went in there, those are M8 bolts, I started tightening them up. So I need to get underneath the car, I may need to remove some things to get access to them, um, but I'm gonna tighten all those up and hopefully that ticking noise goes away. So, fingers crossed. All right guys, that is it for this video. I really appreciate it um, for everyone who has commented, um, folks who are interested in seeing the whole progression of this car. Trust me, it will be on the track, but I, I just need to get these other things straightened out. I can't have it leaking. I can't have it overheating. I can't have it making funny noises and then take it out there at, you know, 6,500, 7,000 RPM wide open on the track. So um, I want to get all the stuff figured out. And then in the next few videos, I'm doing a couple more tune-up things. Um, and then we'll start getting into the fun track stuff, uh, suspension and things like that. Uh, I've been talking with Maximum Motorsports, so hopefully you will eventually see some Maximum Motorsports uh, parts on this car. Again, thanks for watching. Check me out on Instagram, truck and roll 989. Like, subscribe. I appreciate you guys. Have a good rest of your weekend. Take it easy.